Hi, everyone. Super excited to get started. Um, I will start with my name. Um, so, hi, my name is Maggie McCready. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an archivist here in PNP. Um, before we dive into the collections, um, let me give a brief introduction to the prints and photographs division. Um, here we're showing a picture of the Library of Congress's Capitol Hill campus, where we have three main buildings. The red arrow you see points to where the prints and photographs division is located in the Madison building. And you can see a picture of our reading room on the right. So let me give you a quick rundown of what we'll talk about today. Like the title implies, we'll be talking about fan art. While we might normally think of fan art as a modern phenomenon, it's actually a centuries old tradition. So we'll be exploring both modern examples of fan art in our Small Press Expo collection, as well as some historic examples from our Fine Prints collection and a few other pieces from other museums. We're also going to talk about how fan art can serve as a record and ways to analyze it. We're going to do this in three ways. First, by looking at multiple works of fan art for one thing. Second, fan art that reinterprets the original work. And third, looking at fan art in SPX in aggregate to get a broader sense of the whole pop cultural landscape of a time period. So the last like 10 years. But first, let me introduce you to Small Press Expo. Um, SPX is a small annual festival for artists, writers, and publishers of comic art in its various forms. The first festival was held in 1994, and it's located in Bethesda each September. Basically, it's a convention that's more focused on original art and comics rather than fan culture specifically. Artists will sell prints, original drawings, zines, comics, and books, and so on. Um, there are also several awards, such as the Ignatz Awards for Outstanding Achievement in Comics and Cartooning. Um, and we go every year to collect materials. We do this because independent comics have cultural value too. Um, we want to document the art world as broadly as we can, not just larger scale mass produced comics. Our partnership with Small Press Expo is a joint venture between Prints and Photographs Division and the Serials Division. In 2007, curators from PNP and Serials started attending SPX, and by 2009, the curators tabled just to talk to people and tell them about us. Around that time, Warren Bernard, the president of SPX, began to volunteer in the division and told our curator, Sarah Duke, that LSC should get copies of the Ignatz nominees. Um, in August 2011, a memo of understanding was signed that established an official collecting relationship with Small Press Expo. That September, curators went for the first time specifically to collect things. Um, we focus on collecting mini comics, zines, graphic novels, posters, prints, ephemera, like business cards, postcards, pamphlets, and stickers, um, original art, of course, all the Ignatz Award nominees work, and sometimes, fan art makes its way in there. Um, I attended for the first time in 2019 to help collect, and you can see a picture of our team from 2019 here. Cool. So time for some quick definitions relating to fan culture. What is fan art? Is 2D fan art the only way in which fan culture is expressed? No, the answer is no. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a second. Um, fandom refers to a community of fans. Fan art is made by members of a fandom. Fan art is artwork created by fans of a work of fiction and derived from a series character or other aspect of that work. So, dear audience, why do people make fan art? What is its purpose? Well, an obvious reason is because they like that show or character. Fan art can also be a way that artists practice and hone new skills and can serve as a great portfolio piece. 
For example, artist Felipe Martins was able to get official work with Cartoon Network illustrating their comic book covers because the creator of the show Adventure Time, Pendleton Ward, saw Martins' painting of Marceline, here on the right, on Tumblr, and showed it to its editors. Um, fan art can also be a vehicle for exploring identity and connecting with others, or for exploring difficult topics and emotions. For these and other reasons, many artists produce fan art of popular media. That's also why we see fan fiction, cosplays, and fan conventions. These are all expressions of fan culture. So, dear audience, I am asking you to think about this. Have you ever been to a comic or anime convention? How can you tell what anime is popular at the time? Is it by how many cosplayers they may be for one anime, or how by much how much fan art, pins, charms, or Ida bags there are devoted to characters from that anime? Fandom and the artwork and ephemera they produce can be indicative of a piece of media's popularity and impact at any given time period. Their records. But fan art isn't just a modern genre of art. It's been around for a very long time. You may have seen some of it in museums without realizing, but when we learn about these sculptures and paintings in art history class, we don't usually classify these as fan art. Why is that? This likely has to do with the traditional European hierarchy of the arts and how fine art is presented. Within the European academic tradition, music, architecture, poetry, sculpture, and painting are considered the main fine art mediums. Fine art was considered a higher form of expression than decorative or applied arts because it was not constrained by practicality or function. It just exists to be beautiful or meaningful. Within fine art, there is also a hierarchy of genres, meaning topics or formats that were considered the most culturally important or prestigious. For example, for poetry, the most prestigious genre would be the epic poem. Um, history painting was regarded as the highest form of Western painting comparable to the poetry epic. So a painting that referenced poetry or history was still seen as and presented as fine art, even though we might technically classify that as fan art. So there wasn't a stigma against creating art that referenced other art or history. It was celebrated and respected actually, which is kind of cool. Fan art or the classical paintings that reference literature are often integrated with original works in museums, carefully preserved and made visible through curated exhibitions. This isn't the same level of prestige or care we usually give to modern fan art. But is modern fan art less artwork than an oil painting just because it's a digital print? Well, no, it's affordances are just different. It's more accessible, less rare or precious, produced more quickly at times. They both contain valuable information about culture around the time they were produced. But fan art also kind of has this gray zone. Um, what makes fan art fan art? Does it need to be directly representational of the character or show? Does it need to be positive? What if it's merely referential? Fan art is kind of a woobly thing. But let's get into talking about the many different ways we can examine fan art. We'll start by looking at lots of fan art of the same thing. Let's look at some historic examples of fan art in the 19th century. We'll focus upon the character Ophelia from Shakespeare's Hamlet. The play is about a prince, Hamlet, who's trying to get revenge for the death of his father. Ophelia is a noble woman and love interest for Hamlet. Hamlet kills Ophelia's father, which leads her to wander aimlessly until she accidentally drowns. We never actually see this happen, but hear about it in a verse given by Queen Gertrude, Hamlet's mother. Um, I think we're vaguely familiar with this play, but just in case, there's a link to the Wikipedia page in the chat. Um, and the most famous portrait of Ophelia you might recognize is this 1852 painting by John Everett Millais, 
but there are actually a lot of them made in the 19th century. Kind of funny, um, but here are three different paintings of Ophelia produced decades apart that have remarkably similar compositions. And trust me, there are more of them. I could not fit them on this slide. Um, and so I would ask you, dear audience, to answer in the chat, what do you notice that's similar in how Ophelia is depicted between the three of these? And I'll give like 30 seconds for folks to respond. Yes, okay, I think we're seeing a lot of the same stuff, guys. Um, a lot of folks mentioned the, the mood, the water, um, her clothing is similar, the nature, her pose is similar. Um, everything, a lot of it is very similar. Um, no shoes, even though she's outside, yes. Well, actually she does have shoes in the center. They are kind of flesh toned, <laughs> but um, yes, there are a lot of similarities here. Um, there are a lot more than this, but why are there so many? Shakespeare was really popular in the Victorian period. Part of this is because of Victorian culture surrounding religion and literature. Literature is a highly respected art form in Victorian England, and Christianity is the dominant religion. During the early 19th century, there's a rise in scholarship of the different Shakespeare manuscripts and adaptations at the same time that people are studying Bible manuscripts. Um, there were a couple different revisions of the Bible that were printed in the 1880s. And there's a lot of conversation and interest in the way that these manuscripts can be interpreted. What develops is this religious connection and association between poetry and the Bible as inspired works, and that Shakespeare's poetry is so good that it feels divinely inspired. It's a really interesting idea. Um, if you want to learn more about it, there's a really cool podcast from the Folger Shakespeare Library. So that's kind of the landscape we're in. And one explanation for Shakespeare's popularity from the religious angle. But remember the hierarchy of the arts that we mentioned earlier. The Victorians valued literature, specifically poetry, as one of the highest forms of art. These influences are really evident in the work of art movements like the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which were a loose group of artists and poets that were considered were inspired by paintings from the Italian Renaissance, medieval culture, nature and romanticism, and Christian themes. Bringing it back to the hierarchy of genres, they produced a lot of history paintings, which were seen as the most prestigious version of painting. Pre-Raphaelites sought to legitimize themselves by creating works closely associated with literature. And as a Renaissance poet already being venerated in religious circles, Shakespeare seems like a great choice for the pre-Raphaelites. A lot of our Ophelias are painted by them. Um, and the pre-Raphaelites particularly liked Ophelia because they wanted to create images that weren't just about being pretty, but that reflect the inner self and the workings of the mind. Um, and these paintings place Ophelia's youth and beauty in opposition to her death, depicting the tragedy of a wasted life kind of like the beautiful and poetic description Gertrude gives about Ophelia's death. So each of the Ophelias reflects something different from the time it was painted. Here we have two Ophelias. One is a reproduction of the other one done 50 years later. The original painting on the left is Richard Redgrave's Ophelia Weaving Her Garlands made in 1842. This print we hold at LSC on the right is a reproduction of the painting. The chromolithograph print was created by H. Saunders in 1891 for a book called Shakespeare's Heroes and Heroines, published by Raphael Tuck and Sons. So I would ask you, friends in the chat, um, could you answer for me, what do you notice that's different between the two of these? And I'll give you approximately 20 seconds to answer. The background's definitely different. The second one is lighter. Yes.
You guys are very perceptive. I'm loving it. <laughs> I think a print can be produced a lot quicker than a painting a lot of the time. Um, I think you're correct, Jeremy. Yes, the contrast in the shadows. Excellent observation, folks. Um, so the background, particularly, it's a lot darker in the 1842 painting. The dark red water resembles blood, a color physically connected to Ophelia as red poppies drop from her lap and into the water. Poppies were considered a highly symbolic flower in England in the 1840s because in the early 19th century, scarlet corn poppies grew over the battlefields from the Napoleonic Wars. As a consequence of this, red poppies became a symbol of death. And it's possible that this meaning may have been lost 50 years later in 1891. The H. Saunders reproduction is by comparison much lighter. Um, and since this is also a reproduction of a painting of a literary character, you could kind of say that this is fan art of fan art. <laughs> so a little meta there. One modern example in the Small Press Expo collection we'll use to talk about multiple pieces of fan art being made for one thing is Dark Souls. And I know we're all excited to talk about it. Um, so Dark Souls is a video game series that's the spiritual successor to the 2009 game Demon Souls, which you can see the cover art for in the bottom right. With the first game released in 2011, the second in 2014, and the third in 2016. It's a dark fantasy action role-playing game developed by From Software and directed by Hidetaka Miyazaki. It's quite atmospheric and haunting. You play as this undead character in a world where humanity has been cursed with being unable to die, which has driven many of them to madness, causing society to collapse as a result. As the chosen undead, you must become the new Lord of Cinder to break the curse. Um, and that's the best synopsis I can provide. I did my best, I promise. Um, it's famously known for being extremely difficult with frequent death to be expected. The screenshot you see here in the top right is of Anne Orlando, which is a really important location in the game that we'll talk about in a second. Um, we have two examples of fan art from two different artists from different years. So we have this lovely triptych um, by the artist Cole Pritchard. Um, and this triptych depicts three locations or scenes in the game, focusing on the player character's experience. The first is Anne Orlando, a really plot significant location. The seat of the gods where you get the Lord vessel, which is a key item. The second is Ash Lake, an optional secret area that is a wide open space with trees where you meet an ancient dragon. And the final scene depicts King Seeker Frampt, a primordial serpent trying to convince you to use the Lord vessel to preserve the age of fire and break the curse. So let's get a closer look. Um, and the artist Cole Pritchard had this to say about why he made the triptych. I picked the locations that had a big emotional impact on me. Seeing Anne Orlando for the first time after slogging through the dark gray and brown of the undead burg, the depths and blight town was such a powerful experience. The light and majesty of it was just draw drop, jaw dropping to say the least. As for Ash Lake, that is unequivocally my favorite location in any Souls game. There's just so much about it that really moves me, and it really hits all at once when you first see it. The second you emerge from the hollow tree pathway, you're met with a huge vista of hundreds of massive trees extending into the foggy distance, and you immediately hear music. The only other time you hear music outside of a boss battle is Firelink Shrine, I believe. It's just hugely transportive for me. It's got such a strong, powerful atmosphere that I absolutely fell in love with, even though it's a relatively small and simple area. And as for the Lord Vessel and Frampt, that subject was mainly a summation of the profound strangeness and silliness that I love about Dark Souls. What's better to capture that than a big weird snake man with giant teeth and floppy mustache things? 
Our next piece um, is Jolly Undead Outcasts by Natasha Tara Petrovich. Um, and this artist depicts multiple locations in the game at once, in Orlando and several earlier levels in the game. The Bridge of the Undead Berg, um, guarded by a fire drake, the Lower Berg and the Capra Demon, who is one of the bosses, and the Undead Parish and its bell. She also focuses on some of the more memorable non-player characters or NPCs in the game, depicting the Jolly Undead Outcasts, um, which is a reference to the NPC patches depicted here, second from the left. Um, patches is a tricky character that keeps trying to kill you by knocking you off of a bridge or off of a cliff to steal your gear. When you don't die, he tries to backtrack by saying it was just an accident and says, you and me, we're jolly undead outcasts, aren't we? Um, he's actually in almost every Souls game. That's debatable. Um, so he's a pretty prominent character. And the artist uh, Petrovich had this to say about it. Dark Souls is one of my favorite video games. When I make a piece like this, it's because I want to make an illustration that encompasses the larger experience of the game, kind of distilling it into a potent slice of the overall thing. Dark Souls has a very connected world and characters, so I wanted to capture that here by including a lot of characters and areas. Notice that the same structure, Anne Orlando, is depicted in both works. This is a significant location in the game, as we mentioned, for both visual and plot reasons. The way the map is designed in Dark Souls 1, you can see Anne Orlando looming over the first level, the Undead Berg. Compared to the other drab, gray locations in the game, the city is visually stunning, appearing golden and bathed in the light of perpetual sunset. It's actually based on the Il Duomo Cathedral in Milan, if you've ever been there. Um, Plot-wise, Anne Orlando is the now abandoned capital of this world that used to be the seat of power for the gods. The player character must travel here to collect the Lord Vessel, from Guinevere, who instructs you to use it to kill Lord Gwyn and become the new Lord of Cinder to break the curse of the undead, which is the end of the game. Um, the inclusion of Anne Orlando in both works reflects acknowledgement of its plot significance in the games. Both of these depict Dark Souls 1, which came out in 2011. Cole Pritchard's Triptych was made in 2015, and Natasha Petrovich's was collected in 2019. The fact that these works were made years after the game first came out reflects its lasting impact upon them. And Dark Souls might not yet be considered a classic, but like we talked about with Shakespeare, some literary works are so popular or impactful years after they've been created that they've become hailed as classics. Classic stories have been retold, adapted, and remade countless times, but each adaptation reveals something about the creator and the time in which it's been adapted. These adaptations are generally made by someone who is a fan of the original. So fan art doesn't just have to be a direct redraw or unadulterated copy of the original work. When artists infuse their own imagery or meaning into an adaptation, this can also provide a lot of information about how societal sentiments have changed since the original work was made or the artist's relationship to it. Um, another example of a classic story is Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The original illustrations for the book were done in 1865 by John Tenniel, depicted here. Um, here are the chapter page illustrations for chapter two, The Pool of Tears. Um, as well as the page illustrations that he did. And I'm comparing that to um, some work by Salvador Dali. So hold, hold, hold on. Um, in 1969, Dali was commissioned by Random House to do the chapter art for a special book of the month edition of Alice in Wonderland. Salvador Dali created 12 heliogravure prints one for each chapter and an etching for the cover. There were only 2,700 copies of this edition printed, which makes it pretty rare. But there are some loose prints out there. We actually have two of those prints at Library of Congress. And I'm highlighting some details here. 
Um, but if you would like to see the full pieces as I talk about them, you can click on the links that we've provided in the chat. Um, on the right here is a detail of the pool of tears. Um, I drew this as a study, um, but here you go. Um, and this is the print that we hold in our collection. What's interesting is Salvador Dali also incorporated some of his own motifs into the work. To represent Alice, the sole character who appears in every chapter, he reused an image of a girl skipping rope that he had first painted more than 30 years earlier. And that's the detail you see depicted on the left, girl skipping in a landscape from 1936. Um, you can see the earlier version here, yes. And we can also compare his illustrations to the original John Tenniel illustrations. Why was this work made and why does it exist? Asking that question helps us understand the context. The answer for us may come from Princeton's 2015 reissue of the 1969 edition of Alice in Wonderland for its 150th anniversary. Um, the introduction was written by Mark Burstein, and he states, Salvador Dali placed this strange, static, mid-motion figure, almost an icon, in each of the 12 illustrations, a choice that was part automatism, part cut-up technique, as if echoing Carol's incantation from the first page, the rest next time. It is next time. And Burstein continues. Even the creative processes of Carol and the Surrealists were similar. The Surrealists practiced automatism in their writing and drawing. Carol called the initial telling of Alice in Wonderland effortless, saying that every such idea and nearly every word of the dialogue came of itself. In addition, collages were a serious apparatus in the Surrealist, Surrealist arsenal. Carol invented the term portmanteau combining words and produced Jabberwocky, the most famous example of pure neologistic nonsense in the English language. And so in 1969, there was this connection made between surrealism and this literary work that was produced decades before the art movement even began. So Alice in Wonderland has this persistent relevance. I'm sure we're aware of other adaptations um, that have been created recently or within recent years. So let's mosey along. Um, another example of a story that's persisted over time is St. George and the Dragon. Maybe not classic status, but it's an old story that I read in an anthology um, as a child. Um, and Albert Dürer also made some fan art of our boy George way back in 1508. And we have many more examples um, digitized in our online catalog. And how many of us are familiar with the story of St. George and the Dragon? Go ahead and say yes or no in the chat. But um, I will also give you a synopsis. Um, basically, the story is this. There's a dragon terrorizing a village and demands tribute. Ultimately, a princess is going to be sacrificed. St. George, a knight, comes by and slays the dragon, saves the princess, saves the village. Classic fairy tale. Um, if you want to know more about it, here's the Wikipedia page. Um, but I'd also like to say, um, in this work on the right, artist Natalie Anderson has rewritten the ending, and this is what she had to say about it. Based on the story of St. George and the Dragon, this piece questions why George has to be the hero. Here, the princess of a kingdom plagued by a dragon decides to kill it instead of living in fear of it. Instead of George coming to her rescue seemingly out of the blue, she takes matters into her own hands and slays the dragon for the good of her kingdom. And while I don't think that the story of St. George was extremely popular in 2017, this reinterpretation of a classic story reflects a shift from the traditional fairy tale narrative of the damsel in distress to a more modern feminist story where the princess feels empowered to save herself. And actually, um, if you look in our online catalog, uh, PPOC, um, we have a lot of older historic works that depict St. George um, and 
most of them really focus on him and his heroism and the princess is not really uh, featured at all. So the focus is really on the man in the story in these older works. Um, so the reinterpretation or adaptation of a work can give us some information also. When an artist makes fan art, their influence is always there and they may change some things stylistically or thematically. And this kind of gets into the territory of inspiration. I feel like you could classify Natalie Anderson's work as an original artwork that was merely inspired by the story rather than fan art. So again, the line of what can be considered fan art is kind of hazy. But I think that's what's really interesting about modern artists interpreting older stories is that you can see how societal sentiments, ideas, or aesthetics have changed from then to now because the context they were each created in is totally different. Um, it's maybe not as obvious when you're looking at a contemporary artist reinterpreting a contemporary work. I don't know, something to think about. Finally, I wanted to talk about looking at fan art in aggregate. Something to keep in mind is that today, art is produced at such a rate and scale that it can react to certain things much faster. So it can be easier to track what's going on in pulp culture now than in the past. It could take weeks or years to finish a painting in the 19th century. So that's maybe why you don't see the quantity and perhaps can't track changes by year um, in the same way that you could with modern fan art. And often it's the volume of fan art rather than the individual quality that is valuable. Are there multiple pieces of fan art for one short character for sale at the same time at the same convention? What characters do we see repeat each year? What characters do we see at all? It's worth noting that fan art today is often made to be sold and that it can be really lucrative genre of work for an independent artist. The reason being the artist is taking advantage of the original works pre-existing fan base who already like that thing and are more likely to buy merch for that thing. So considering this, if we see a lot of fan art of one character, it's because all these artists either like the character or realize that art of them will sell well. If we don't see as much fan art, perhaps that show has ended and people have moved on to the next new thing or its popularity has waned. So fan art in Small Press Expo as a more modern collection can be used to see what was popular in any given year in the last, say, 10 years. Um, let's look at some examples. Exciting. So um, I dug through uh, the collection and pulled out uh, individual pieces that I could positively identify um, as being culturally referential. Um, and it's very 2014. <laughs> um, I, I would love to point out this bumper sticker which is very clearly a reference to Twilight, um, which I'm sure many of us remember from middle school. Um, we also have this Breaking Bad poster. So let's think, why do we have this Breaking Bad poster at this time? We have some Steven Universe, which I think initially came out in 2013. Um, we have some fan art of Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, fan art of Mother 3 done by Casey Green, um, this paper doll here is actually Catwoman. Um, and this zine on the left, I think is, gosh, uh, Richard Simmons and Gene Simmons in a, a workout zine. Um, this one's really fun. Um, would recommend reading that if you get the chance, if you want to use the collection. Um, so here's a selection from 2014. Uh, 2015 is not... Um, not, there's not as much in there, but we do have some gems. Um, we have this fun fan art of uh, scientist Carl Sagan. Um, we have the image of Abraham Lincoln's face being uh, adapted and used for the DC Conspiracy Counterculture Fest. And Nightmare the Rat, um, at least feels to me, um, perhaps inspired by the look of uh, Mickey Mouse. So we have that there. So in the following slides, 
Um, I'm just going to keep going along, but I would love if any of you notice or recognize a print and what it's from, um, if you would shout it out in the chat. So here we have 2016. Um, we've got some Star Wars fan art. So which are these characters that they're depicting? Is there a Star Wars movie that came out around this time? Um, and golly gosh, um, if anyone has been on Tumblr, I'm sure that you saw a lot of Sherlock fan art. Yes. Um, so this is Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays um, Sherlock in uh, the mid-2010s adaptation or the show. Um, we also have um, some Hamilton fan art from 2016 as well. Um, and if you'll remember, people were very, still are, uh, we're very into Hamilton when it first came out. So this fan art was made by uh, a fan. Um, we def yes, we also have ALF as well. I think that um, we also have some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think that's a Homer Simpson there as well. So some 90s nostalgia. Excellent eyes, folks. So 2017, um, we have yet more. Star Wars fan art. So we've got Princess Leia and we have a Sith Lord. I think, gosh, I know who this is. You know, it's going to come to me in a sec. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Kylo Ren. <laughs> so yes, we've got Kylo Ren. We have some um, Danny Phantom fan art, Blast from the Past. Um, more scientists, some Mad Max. Um, we've got Willy Wonka. I believe this is the female uh, Egon from the uh, re-release of Ghostbusters that they did a few years ago. Um, we have Deadpool, Spider-Man, and yes, we have Legend of Zelda. Absolutely um, iconic. Um, we also have a really fun one, um, a really nice one that uh, is referential to the Women's March from around that time in the uh, bottom left corner. Um, so actually, I would like to talk about it. Um, why do we see Legend of Zelda fan art in 2017? This is a really long running fandom. Did a new game come out at that time? Yes. <laughs> Breath of the Wild actually came out in March of that year, which is a really highly anticipated game. Um, I also want to mention on the left, we have the K Chronicles and Think Portraits by the artist Keith Knight. Um, it's a long running series of portraits of prominent figures, um, which is a really nice tribute to them. And I think you could classify them as fan art. Um, I'm pointing to this portrait of Maya Angelou because we have it scanned if you wanna look at it in the catalog. And here is 2018. So um, <laughs> yes, it was old day in the middle, Kara. Um, we have, the Lovely Works by Cole Pritchard and Natalie Anderson here. Um, we definitely got a Bowie in there. Um, G.I. Joe, iconic. Um, but this one on the left is really interesting. Um, it's a B movie, B horror movie from the 70s that um, an artist chose to depict in the style of, um, I think, Japanese 80s horror movie posters. Um, that, that one's really cool. It actually has a comic printed on the back about the artist's experience watching the movie for the first time. Um, yes, I'm unsure if that's Ishtar or Inanna. Um, would be worth it would be worth looking into, honestly. Um, but yeah, so this is a selection of things. Um, from 2018 and my personal favorite i am biased because i was there and i helped collect a lot of these pieces is 2019 um here we have the lovely uh dark souls fan art by natasha tara petrovich and we also have her katamari davisi fan art um really great game i loved that one i bought a copy for myself um, we have some really cool Godzilla fan art, um, some tarot cards, 
um, more think pieces by Keith Knight. Um, this is fan art here of Siri, um, <laughs> the Apple assistant. Um, and yes, we do also have two pieces of fan art of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, we've got a Julia Child as well. Um, I believe these two stickers are from Good Omens. Um, this, this postcard here is uh, depicting all of the characters that uh, the actress Lucy Liu has, Liu has uh, ever played or voice acted. Um, and then I think this is from Sekiro, Shadows, Shadows Die. How many times do they die? Once or twice? Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks folks. Um, so uh, that is a selection from 2019. Thank you, they die two times, they die twice. Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. Um, delightful. Um, so thank you for going on this journey with me through the past few years of Small Press Expo. Um, so in closing, you can see the value of fan art. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can look at fan art and you can use the fan art and Small Press Expo for research. Um, but SPX has so much more than that. There's a lot of really beautiful original work as well. Um, and you yourself can go to Small Press Expo in September. Um, it's in person this year. Um, and you can collect some of your own artwork as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming. <laughs>